Uh, this last section of this chapter is revisiting formation constants. And we kind of dance around this in Chem 223, these first couple chapters. Um, a formation constant, again, is a type of equilibrium constant, but it's for making complex ions. And uh, the one that we looked at in the Le Chatelier's principal lab was a zinc with four ammonias around it. And it made the solid disappear. Um, these complex ions are aqueous, uh, so they're pretty readily. If you have a complex ion, and you want to write a formation constant expression for it, the thing to realize that's different from what we've just talked about is that the complex ion will be the product. Now, in all these KSPs, the reactant was always the solid, all right? And the solid broke up into its ions. But with a complex ion, a formation constant, KF, the complex ion is the product, and the ions that go into it, or compounds, are the reactants. So it's kind of reversed, and I know that's a little bit weird. This is the KF expression for AgCN2 minus 1. These are all weird kind of looking ions, by the way. But again, whatever, the complex ion is the product, and whatever goes into it are the reactants. So in the zinc thing we did in lab, we'd have Zn, NH34, 2 plus is the product, and the reactants would be zinc 2 plus and NH3 taken to the fourth power, because there's four of them. Here, the AgCN2 minus 1 is the product, and we'd have silver ion times cyanide squared. Um, why we're talking about these is these KF values are usually really, really large, very, very product favored. And that just means that they are going to happen. All right. So if a KF is possible, then usually it happens like gangbusters. It just goes crazy. But the important thing I wanted to point out here is that complex ions are products, and whatever goes into it are the reactants. But with KSPs, which is what we've been looking at in this chapter, the solid is the reactant, and whatever goes into it, those ions will be the products. And that's what's kind of strange about that. Um, KF expressions are, there's KF values are all over the literature too, and these are just one table of values. Um, we talked about small numbers earlier. Julian was asking about some of the 10 to the minus 37. These guys are just as big sometimes for KFs. So here's a mercury cyanide compound that I know caused tons of problems, but look at that K, it's 10 to the 38. It's just huge, right? These KFs are just really large. All of these numbers though, regardless of their magnitude, just means that they're very product favored. Um, here's the KF for the zinc ammonia complex. Again, very, very high. Not as high as the zinc hydroxide Side complex ion we looked at, also in that same lab, but still pretty high. Um, usually the KF expressions are listed as net ionic reactions, which means we wouldn't put like the nitrate with silver, or if this was sodium cyanide, we wouldn't put the sodium ions. We only put the quote-unquote exciting parts in it, which means basically the parts that go into the complex ions. So if you ever do have to write a formation constant, <laughs> Make sure that you pull the spectators out, usually sodium ions, potassium ions, nitrate ions. Questions on that? Complex ions messed with chemists for a long time because they make a solid and they think they were going to make more, and all of a sudden the solid disappeared, which can be really frustrating. But now that it's been understood what's going on, you can make insoluble compounds dissolve. You can make compounds that dissolve come back into solution. There's lots of cool things you can do. Here's a silver chloride example. Silver chloride is pretty insoluble, like we've seen, but it does break up into silver and chloride ions. Well, there's another complex ion where silver reacts with ammonia to make this complex ion, and you can write a KF expression for it. And if you look at these two reactions long enough, silver ion is in both reactions. It's a product in the KSP, it's a reactant in the KF. So if you combine these two and cut out the silver, you can actually figure out what the net K value is. 
Why this is kind of cool is that silver chloride as a solid sometimes coats glassware, like the burettes we used last week, all right? We try and keep our burettes clean, and uh, silver chloride can kind of coat them. However, if you add some ammonium, the ammonia then makes the complex ion pretty readily, and it'll pull that white film off your burettes and beakers and stuff like that. When solutions of silver nitrate and sodium chloride are mixed, insoluble silver chloride precipitates from solution. When we add ammonia to the mixture, however, the precipitate re-dissolves. When ammonia is added to a mixture of solid and aqueous silver chloride, the ammonia serves as a Lewis base. The complex ion formed consists of two ammonia molecules bound to each silver ion. Formation of the complex lowers the concentration of silver in solution, which changes the solubility equilibrium. So in this case, the ammonia attacks the free silver ion that is present. That's like taking the silver out of this reaction. And by Le Chatelet's principle, that means the reaction's gonna move to the right, try and fill in what's being taken care of. So the amount of silver chloride solid goes down quite a bit as more silver ion goes to replace it. So the more ammonia you add in theory, then the more silver ion it takes out, and then more and more silver chloride would happen. So now that scientists kinda of know what's happening with complex ions, we can use them to their our advantage and make soluble things insoluble and vice versa. So. And again, if you had the KSP and the KF, you could literally multiply these Ks together to give the overall K. So that would also give you a sense then if this reaction was reactant favored, product favored, stuff like that. So, uh, any questions? All right, so that's it, chapter 15, one of the most boring, I mean, one of the most interesting chapters because you can affect solubility and stuff like that. Seriously, not as you can probably tell in my all-time favorite chapter, but still important, blah, blah, blah. The nice thing about this next chapter is that we went from one of the slowest, in my opinion, chapters to one of the most interesting chapters. And finally, in this chapter, we're going to talk about another thing that I've danced around, which is entropy. And entropy is just so fascinating. I find entropy just eternally interesting, and not only a scientific level, but also on a personal level. But if nothing else, after learning what entropy is all about, you'll be able to appreciate the multitude of jokes that are out there regarding entropy. So in this little diagram, this is the department of entropy. And if you look like the, tape, the, uh, the door isn't totally on the hinges, there's holes in the floor, um, things are broken, the garbage can is spilled over, uh, stuff like that. There's cracks in the window, <laughs> it's an old calendar, blah, blah, blah. So it's really messed up, all right? And entropy is basically about things that are messy. If you are a person and in your room at home or your house or whatever, if you keep it a little dirtier, a little messier than people like, you can now tell them that, well, you're just really behaving along the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about in this level. Basically, it's saying that you are following entropy, all right? Entropy is about disorder and messiness. So let's see if I can, yes, all right. So here's a bunch of periodic tables. Somebody put them all together really nicely. And, oh, I dropped them. <laughs> all right, as you drop them, they don't usually stay together really nice. It's hard to tell from where you all are right now, but all the papers are kind of squished together. However, because I'm anti-tentative, I'm gonna put them together and they're a little messy, but I'm gonna, you know, do this kind of thing and stuff. And, oh boy, they're pretty good. Now probably some of the papers have been mixed together as I did that, but notice how it was easy to make things disordered and it took a little energy and time to put them back in some kind of quasi-ordered state. And that, in and of itself, is a really good representation of what entropy is all about. There's a natural proclivity, if you will, for making things messy. So if your room is messy and your mom or dad says, oh, clean up your room, you says, oh, it's entropy, man, I'm really sorry. So anyway, that's not really a good excuse, but it is the normal way of things, to be a little disordered. 
Entropy is an important part of chemical reactions as well. All right. <clears throat> so when Bethany brought up uh, what we were talking there about the nuclear waste that has to be labeled, that was a very relevant discussion because over time, entropy starts to kick in. Entropy is very, very natural, and I can see why. You know, ten thousand years, you may not have the same labels, different kinds of language, and stuff like that. So think about how entropy affects you in your life. It's a great discussion of, of topic uh, over a certain type of beverages uh, and stuff like that, as well as something really interesting to think in terms of science as well. Now, this whole level, uh, we're going to be talking about entropy and how it's affected by enthalpy, which we have talked about a lot. But before we even go there, I just want to review something from Chem 222, which was thermodynamics versus kinetics, all right? Now, thermodynamics, which is really what this chapter is about, is the yes or no for the reactions. Will they occur? Will they not occur? That's really what thermodynamics is great for, all right? And that's super important. And we're gonna spend a lot of time in this chapter talking about when reactions will occur or when they won't occur. But in the back of your mind, keep remembering about kinetics, which is the speed of reactions. And as an example of this, we've talked uh, in Chem 221 and Chem 222 in my classes, how, for example, diamonds are all thermodynamically gonna turn into graphite one day. So something that's worth a lot of money, if you go to the jewelers, is going to be worth pencil lead value when everything is done. But as I talked about, don't go selling your diamonds. The process of turning diamonds into graphite is very, very slow. And it won't happen in our children's, children's, children's lifetimes. So you go ahead and hold on and appreciate your diamonds. It will happen eventually, but it's so slow that we don't have to worry about that. So kinetics is always a player in the background. All right, we're gonna talk about reactions that occur, that they don't occur, but you must remember that the speed of the reactions, especially for us as human beings with a 70-ish year lifespan, we have to think about kinetics when it comes right down to it. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, here's a diagram more from Chem 222 now that we showed where reactants were on the left and products are on the right. And in Chem 222, we talked about how if products are higher than reactants, then it takes energy to do this. This is like endothermic and stuff like that. But the energy required to get to the high point of this graph, the energy of activation or activation energy we talked about in kinetics, that's what determines how fast a reaction goes, all right? And if this barrier is high, then reactions are pretty slow. On the other hand, if you can add a catalyst or if it's naturally lower, then your reactions will go pretty quickly. So we won't show these diagrams too much, but I do want you to think about it. Um, spontaneity is basically a way to say if a reaction is going to occur or not. We'll talk about that more later. Any questions? On... Okay. All right. Now will the two of you please get out of here and leave me alone? You're wasting energy, Mr. Plummer. Relax. This is the outer limits. Oh. What did you do to him? He's a scientist. He knows energy must not be wasted. And time. Energy and time are two most precious possessions. You don't have to worry about me, Janet. I'm fine. Bam! That part hit it right on the head. Now it's cheesy and tacky. The Outer Limits from the early 60s. You gotta appreciate Anyway, if you like it or not, whatever. However, I'm a scientist. I know that energy must not be wasted. And time. Energy, thermodynamics, time, kinetics. Hits it right on the head, man. So anyway, you don't have to watch The Outer Limits or watch Star or appreciate Star Trek or anything like that, but at least you'll see now where they're coming from. So, so, kinetics, time, important, but we won't talk about it so much in this chapter, but keep it in the back of your mind, because just as he said there as a sub note, it is important, but energy is what we're going to go after, which things happen, which things don't happen. All right. Now, in Chem 221, and we talked about a little bit in Chem 222, 
The first law of thermodynamics, really important, it's conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. The energy of the universe is constant. And the energy, as we've seen from thermodynamics, is system and surroundings. System is the actual part that's reacting, doing something, and surroundings is everything else. Now, in Chem 221, briefly, we talked about how energy can be expressed as both heat and work. Now, work is something that chemists don't usually talk about. This is something where physics and engineers get really into. So moving objects, uh, stuff like that, that would be work. But heat is huge, and heat, if it's at constant pressure, is what enthalpy is all about. And in Sense Chem 221, I've, we've talked a lot about enthalpy. And just the other day, we talked about how exothermic means heat's released. That's a negative delta H. On the other hand, a positive delta H is endothermic, and it takes energy to make it happen, all right? So, by the way, I the first in law of the I can't resist. But anyway, this is kind of an overview of what we've seen so far, thermodynamic-wise, in these classes, all right? Enthalpy has been the big player, and enthalpy is basically heat energy, all right? Heat's given off, exothermic. Heat is absorbed, it feels cold, that's endothermic. And so far, we've been using enthalpy as our guide to if a reaction is going to occur or not. But we're going to see there's better ways to do that here in a little bit. Any questions? And now, maximum energy! Okay, I don't know why I put that in there. I thought that was funny at the time. That's from uh, the uh, worst movie in the world. Kind of thing. Anyway, we'll go on. <laughs> um, here's just an over... <laughs> I think I need to chill out on my bad movie references, or maybe have more. But anyway, anyway, profit back on. So far, in Chem 221 and Chem 222, all right, enthalpy, big player, delta H. If it's exothermic, that means delta H was negative. Endothermic means delta H is positive. In Chem 221, Hess's law was when you took the delta H of products minus delta H of reactants. Um, we also combined different reactions together to give you an overall value. Here are some of the delta H products minus delta H reactant values from the table. In Chem 222, we looked at bond enthalpies. So when you have actual Lewis structures, bonds broken minus bonds formed, these were all ways to calculate delta H. All right. Um, this products minus reactants is something we will do in this, in this chapter. All right, we won't look so much at bond enthalpies. Bond enthalpies are really cool in organic chemistry if you happen to know all the different molecules and what they've combined as, but we will look at these kind of things here. These are called formation enthalpies because one mole of the compound is being made. So as an example, if you look at these numbers right here, uh, it looks like acetylene has a negative number, so making it is exothermic. Um, on the other hand, benzene here is a positive compound, so that would have a positive delta H endothermic. Any questions on that? I think this table should be over a little bit, so I apologize for that. Just ignore the things here on the right. Okay. So enthalpy has been a huge part of, of our thermodynamics so far. And again, so far, basically what I've been kind of alluding to is that exothermic reactions are the ones that occur, and endothermic reactions are the ones that don't occur. But there's actually a lot more to it, and that's what we're going to start getting into in this section. Okay. okay. So thermodynamics, again, is kind of the yes or no for reactions. I sometimes talk about it as a thumbs up or a thumbs down reaction. If a reaction will occur, then the system is favored to react, and that means you're going to have more products than reactants. So if you think now in terms of Chem 223, when we talk about equilibrium constants, the Ks that are greater than 1, those are the product favored reactions. And chemists call product favored reactions spontaneous. Now, I don't really like the name spontaneous because when I think of spontaneous, I think, hey, let's all go get tickets for Doctor Strange right now. Woohoo! Something spontaneous, like you're doing it instantaneous, that spur of the moment. 
But that's not what this spontaneous means. Spontaneous in thermodynamics means that the reaction is going to occur. It doesn't mean you're doing it like right now. That would be more a kinetics kind of thing. All right. So in this chapter, when I talk about spontaneous, it doesn't mean, hey, let's all go get ice cream. Woohoo! It means, no, it means that reaction will occur. I don't tell you how long it's going to take to occur, but it will occur given enough time. All right. I am just the messenger. I did not use this term. Now, most product favored reactions, most spontaneous reactions are exothermic but not all of them. A non-spontaneous reaction would be a reaction which gets a thumbs down from thermodynamics. And those usually need energy to make them occur, like they'll be endothermic, all right? <clears throat> now remember, all reactions require an energy of activation to make them happen, kinetics. You have to get over that barrier. And if your energy of activation is a huge barrier, it's going to be slower, stuff like that. Spontaneity doesn't imply anything about time. So again, spontaneous in this context doesn't mean, you know, hey, let's all go, you know, get something to eat at Burger King or whatever. It just means that the reaction will occur, but it doesn't say anything about how long it's going to take to happen. All right. So fast and slow does not apply in this chapter when I talk about spontaneous spontaneity. Finally, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can't be created or destroyed, does not predict if a reaction is going to occur. Like, will it be spontaneous or not? The first law just applies to all systems. You can't create or destroy energy. You can rearrange the energy. That's what first law is all about. Some reactions that will be easier for than others, but it doesn't say if the reaction will occur or not. Okay, so as a review, Chem 221 and Chem 222, enthalpy was king. Enthalpy, basically exothermic reactions, or those are the ones that usually happen, and generally endothermic reactions don't happen. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. So in this discussion, we're going to start talking about spontaneous and non-spontaneous. Spontaneous is just a fancy way to say that the reaction will occur. Non-spontaneous means the reaction probably won't occur. Uh, we always need to think about energy of activation and kinetics. And finally, the first law of thermodynamics just says that energy can't be created or destroyed. It doesn't say anything about if a reaction will happen or not. So here's some rea examples of spontaneous reactions. <laughs> All right. The regular iron nail, you leave it out in the rain like this weekend. After a while, it's going to get rusty. No question about it. So going from iron to rust, which is an iron three oxide, that's gonna be spontaneous. That reaction will occur. Now on the other hand, if you want your rusty nail to turn back into a regular nail, that would be non-spontaneous, all right? It would take energy to make that happen. Like I think you can add some chemicals to remove the rust so you'd end up with a regular one, um, but it would be difficult. It's not something that'll happen. So the Generally, reactions are spontaneous in one direction and non-spontaneous in the other. They will occur one way, and they are more difficult to occur in the other way. Now, when I dropped the papers earlier, that was spontaneous. That was easy. On the other hand, putting the papers back together in the same order took some time and effort, so that was non-spontaneous. We were able to make it happen, more or less, but it's not the same as it was before. Some reactions, again, they will, they're supposed to be spontaneous, but their kinetics are so slow. So diamonds to graphite, it's going to happen, but it's going to take a gazillion years. The kinetics is super slow, high energies of activation, so don't worry about it. On the other hand, this piece of paper, you spark it up, it's gone. It's turned into ash and stuff right away. Paper is ready to go. It's product favored. Just like diamonds ready to go to graphite, this one is just more kinetically accessible to our time frame. This one would be difficult to do it. So both of these reactions are spontaneous. They're going to happen. But again, their timeline is different. And that's why in this chapter, spontaneous just means it will occur, but it doesn't say when it's going to occur.
Is that cool? All right, some reactions are reversible dependent on temperature. And a great example of this is ice and water, all right? So if you have a temperature that's above the freezing point of water and you leave the ice out, it will spontaneously turn to liquid water, all right? Having the liquid water go back to ice above zero degrees Celsius, probably not gonna happen. On the other hand, you want the ice to go to, to, or the water to go back to ice, heck yeah, put it in the freezer. Lower your temperature to a temperature less than zero. Now it's spontaneous for the liquid water to turn back to ice. So temperature is absolutely a player when it comes to spontaneity. Sometimes high temperatures will favor like one direction and low temperatures will favor the other one. So this will be another part of what we're talking about here. If a reaction is uh, spontaneous, what's the temperature uh, at which these things will start happening? Now, another thing to think about is a reversible process. Um, ice going to liquid water, liquid water going back to ice, that would be reversible. And if you think about it from a science perspective, the system has to in one way get rid of heat and then the other way it takes it back in to make it happen if it's reversible. And it is possible, like in that ice to liquid water, liquid water to ice, if you change the temperature, it will happen. In the real world, it's pretty rare. Like making my iron nail that's rusty go back to iron would be pretty rough. I could singe off the rust and have the iron underneath show through, but having the actual iron that's now rust be the iron, that would be pretty tough. So having a true reversible reaction is pretty, pretty rare. Um, our equilibria are examples where usually it's somewhat feasible to have it be reversible, all right? So PBI2, if it goes into the ions, in theory, you can make the ions go back to the solid. That would be a pretty good reversible reaction. But in the real world, it's pretty rare. Like if you, for example, eat a, a donut, <laughs> but eat the donut, energy's given off, you're good to go. But it's hard to make that donut back again. <laughs> if you think about biological processes, it's kind of disgusting on one level. Uh, that would be very difficult. So most processes in the real world, one direction and one direction only. Um, irreversible processes cannot be undone by reversing it. So again, taking that consumed donut and making a donut, probably not going to happen. All right. Um, here's a nice car. Nice cars inevitably will get old after a while. That would be a spontaneous reaction. And making the rusty car go back to a car like that would be very, very difficult. I would call it non-spontaneous. Um, it would take some significant work, of course, on it, your body replacing parts and stuff like that, uh, but it's very, very difficult. So spontaneous processes generally are irreversible, one direction, one direction only. Sometimes through some magical things, you can make a, a reaction go the other way, but generally speaking, it's pretty tough to do. Okay. So all of this led scientists, especially at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, to think about the probability that reactions will happen at all. Like how probable is it that a reaction, any random collection of molecules will react? How probable is it that they'll get a thumbs up to make whatever product they are? And interestingly enough, when people studied all reactions, they found that dispersal, will make a reaction more probable. So dispersion just means something's concentrated and it's being dispersed over a wider area. And if your reaction involves dispersal, energy or matter, then your reaction is more likely to occur. And I find that really interesting, by the way. Now dispersal can be an energy dispersal, like you have something concentrated in energy and you disperse it. So for example, you take a donut and you eat it, all of a sudden, that sugar high, man, you're on it. <laughs> all right, that's spontaneous. That reaction's going to occur. On the other hand, you can have some reactions, very concentrated matter, and they, like explosion or something like that, uh, then the matter is dispersed over a larger area. 
and some reactions will have dispersal of both energy and matter. So if you have a reaction that fits in one of these categories, your reaction is more likely to occur. This is the grave site of Boltzmann. Boltzmann was one of the great scientists that studied this. He was one of the first people to think about what entropy was all about. We'll talk about this equation a little bit. Um, Boltzmann was kind of a funky guy. If you take the gas, the energy gas constant, 8.3145, and you uh, divide by Avogadro's number, you end up with what's called the Boltzmann constant. And that's not something we use in this class, but if you hear about the Boltzmann constant, it's related to our energy R constant. So Boltzmann was a pretty powerful person in this field. Consider a pair of flasks, one containing gas molecules, the other completely empty. If the flasks are connected at their mouths, gas in the filled flask will move spontaneously to the empty flask by its molecular motions. Eventually, the distribution of molecules will be even throughout the flasks. The final state in which the matter is more dispersed is much more probable than the initial undispersed state. Some of these things are things that you're like, duh, of course, but when you think about it with this new hat, thermodynamics hat on, it's kind of profound. So for example, here's a vacuum on one side and a gas on the other side, and they open the flask. Well, duh, of course, the, sol the concentrated solid is gonna diffuse over to the side with the vacuum. So at the end, you should have just as much gas on both sides. And that's an example of matter dispersal. Like you started with a concentrated mass and it went to a more dispersed mass phase. Now, if you have mass on both sides, the chances of all the mass on one side going to just the other side, not very likely, right? And so matter dispersal is a real force of nature. It's, it's weird, but uh, it is true. So having organized things in your room, it's almost inevitable that stuff's going to be distributed, like messiness, all right? It's a weird kind of phenomenon. And to make both sides co coalesce to one side, it's going to take some energy. That's why cleaning your room, your house and stuff, is not something that happens by default. You have to apply energy. So, here's a question. Which process represents matter dispersal? And remember, matter dispersal means concentrated matter to a more dispersed place. Cleaning your messy room? No, because that's taking all the messiness and putting it in a more concentrated form. So that would not be matter dispersal, all right? If you have a gas and you're condensing it to a liquid, that's not dispersing the matter either. That's actually making it more concentrated. However, or no, never mind. Crystallizing a solid, all right, that would be like if you have a solution of ions running around and you get all the ions to go into a solid. Well, that's not distributing the mass. That's actually coalescing the mass as well. So all three of these have had the process of taking stuff that's messed up and putting it in a smaller area. <laughs> By the way, this last one, Jonah, is what you did in lab last week. That's the ammonium dichromate. But anyway, had seven things However, uh, staying on target, eating dinner. Well, you've got concentrated dinner. Everybody at your table is eating it and stuff like that. It goes through our body. Yeah, that's matter dispersal. That's taking concentrated food sources and distributing them throughout our body so all the bonds are broken down. And the food, which might have been in the center of the table, let's say there's four people at your table, then all that food is distributed in four different people and re-broken down from there. That's absolutely matter dispersal. So eating dinner, eating food, is always then a spontaneous thing too. All right, you're going to have that matter dispersed around. Any questions? So eating a snack at home is studying for chemistry and <laughs> studying matter dispersal. Yep. Oh yeah. The implications of this chapter are huge, Juliana. And you're beginning to see something that's pretty important. So hang tight. <laughs> Love it. Other questions? All right. Stored chemical potential energy is released from reactant molecules in an exothermic reaction. This energy spreads out or disperses over the product molecules and the molecules in the surroundings. 
So this is an example of having a concentrated energy source and it reacts. And the energy of that does make the reactive molecules turn into something else. But what happens is the energy goes out in the system. So the outer water molecules are more excited and stuff like that happening. Um, the example I like to use here is that you eat like a gummy bear. Now, yeah, eating a gummy bear distributes through throughout your body, like I said earlier, but gummy bears have actually a lot of energy. It's a sugar source, all right? So you start feeling that sugar high and stuff like that. That energy is being distributed amongst your body. So if your reaction has an energy dispersal, it's more likely to occur. If it takes energy to make it happen, it's not as likely to occur. So when we think about reactions, all right, exothermic reactions absolutely are, pro are programmed to happen because energy is being released, negative delta H, exothermic. So exothermic reactions definitely should be spontaneous in theory because all that energy is being released, more probable to make it happen. The potential energy, which is the energy of the molecule before the reaction happens, starts out in just a few molecules. It's concentrated, but as it reacts, then that energy is released. It not only goes to the new product molecules, but it also goes to the solvent or the air molecules, whatever happens to be around it. Chemists call the water molecules, the air molecules, the glass container, whatever. Those are the surroundings. The energy goes from the system, which is the exciting part, to the surroundings, the outside part. All right? And if you have more energy dispersed, that's a more probable product favored reaction, usually. Now in Chem 221 and Chem 222, I would have argued that all of our exothermic reactions are reactions that are gonna happen. They're spontaneous, they're going to occur. But as you can see right here, not all the time. Talk about that in a second. Thermite is the reaction used in Breaking Bad in season one. And their example of thermite, I think, was way too powerful. But it is a very powerful exothermic reaction. It's iron three oxide and aluminum making iron and aluminum oxide. There's no uh, sound with this video. But anyway, they have basically like a sand container. They're adding a little bit of glycerin. And if you do this just right, oh man, it really takes off. This is the delta H value. It's very negative, it's very exothermic, and a lot of energy is given off. Now thermite can be used for explosives and stuff like that. Um, again, in Breaking Bad, that scene, I, I just wasn't buying it, I don't think it was big enough. But anyway, at the end, you have pure iron and aluminum oxide and stuff like that given off. So anyway, exothermic, the exciting you know, explosions and fireworks and stuff like that, those guys definitely are doing it. Now in this chapter, we would say the thermite reaction is spontaneous because it's happening. You're seeing something happens, all right? Going from the reactants to products is spontaneous. Probably going from products back to reactants would be non-spontaneous. It would be more difficult. And we can see it's exothermic. Product favored reactions generally have energy dispersal and or mass dispersal. This is absolutely energy dispersal. So the exciting reactions are the spontaneous ones and they're usually exothermic. In the center beaker is water at room temperature. To this we add solid ammonium nitrate. The ammonium nitrate dissolves. Usually, a reaction that occurs so readily is exothermic, but we see from the thermometer that this reaction is endothermic. The temperature of the water drops significantly. This reaction is not favored energetically, yet it still occurs. Now, having a thermite reaction, sodium and water, ammonium dichromate, the volcano reaction, these are exciting reactions, right? Yeah, something's happening, man. So those exothermic reactions, product favorite, spontaneous, blah, blah, blah. Solid ammonium nitrate, you put it in water, you stir it up, it dissolves. Whoopie-doo, <laughs> all right? Not very exciting, man. They didn't use that reaction in Breaking Bad. However, why it's exciting for this chapter is it happens, all right? 
it's spontaneous, all right? It's going, we didn't have to do a lot, we stirred it up a little bit. It's endothermic. It's actually taking energy from the outside in. So it's not, you know, whiz bang kind of cool, but it is exciting in its own way because we wouldn't normally, before this chapter, think about an endothermic reaction as being something that occurs, all right? So this reaction and others like it just tell us that it's more than enthalpy that's required to describe when reactions occur or not. All right, this is an endothermic reaction that does happen. All right, it's not exciting. All right, I don't see any explosions, color changes, blah, blah, blah. But it happens without anything, us doing anything to it. So it's more than just exothermic reactions, which is what we've been using so far to predict if a reaction is going to happen. And that's what this new chapter is all about. We're going to look at a better way to describe why some reactions happen and why they don't. And enthalpy is absolutely a player, but it's more than enthalpy. Okay, so this reaction, watching the solid dissolve, woohoo! But anyway, because it's spontaneous, that's why this, we need a better definition of why reactions occur. And that leads us to entropy. Now, entropy and enthalpy are kind of like a yin-yang thing. We saw the acid and base yin-yang thing. Entropy and enthalpy are kind of that way too. Entropy usually gets the symbol S. So while enthalpy was H, entropy is S. And entropy is described as just a measure of disorder. All right, the more disordered or random the final state is relative to the initial state is, that's what entropy is all about, all right? So spontaneity, if a reaction is going to occur or not, is related then to this randomness, this messiness, all right? And that's what entropy is all about. Now, having potassium react with water, very exothermic, a lot of energy is given off. But you're also going to have a lot of disorder at the end because potassium is kind of a solid and it reacts with the thing. You end up with some gas that goes away. So there's also a level of disorder associated with a lot of these reactions that occur so naturally. Clausius of the clausius clapeyron equation from Chem 222 was the first one to coin the name entropy, which I found really interesting. Um, he named it after the Greek word for transformation, apparently trope, I don't know the Greek language, but entropy and enthalpy were that. He thought about enthalpy as like a life-giving substance and entropy as like a death-giving substance. Now, I think that's a little extreme. On the other hand, we'll see why that's not the worst case scenario uh, of all time. So it's kind of cool. So energy enthalpy, he thought, was the giver of life. And entropy transformation is the taker away. He didn't specifically use death in the formal definition, but that's where the idea. He liked it that they were both in terms that began with an E, so they're kind of opposite each other's. Anyway, I found that kind of fascinating. So anyway, entropy and enthalpy are going to be connected, and if you think about both of them, we'll get a better description as to what's happening in the reaction than if we looked at just one of them by itself. So entropy is given the symbol S, and earlier we saw on the gravestone of Boltzmann, of all things, that entropy is equal to K natural log of W. This is not a reaction we're going to, or an equation that we're going to look at in lab or in problem sets or exams, but I wanted to talk about the source of entropy. And entropy is related to the number of microstates for a different molecule. Now, K is this Boltzmann constant. Again, we're not going to use this equation at all, but if you're curious where this stuff comes from, this is what it is. The more microstates that are possible, the higher entropy, all right? And the fewer microstates, the less entropy. So let's go back to my pieces of paper. Uh, here I have one, two, three, four, five pieces of paper, all right? Well, first of all, those microstates can all be disordered. I could have the four white pages on top of the kind of gold page. That would be a microstate. I could also have the gold page on top. That would be a second microstate. I could put the gold page in the middle. All of these would be microstates. 
And the more microstates you have, the more chances for entropy. So throwing the papers on the ground is a great example. Lots and lots of microstates, lots and lots of entropy. All spontaneous endothermic processes indicate have an increase in entropy. Now, this is that ammonium nitrate dissolving in water example. It was super boring to look at. Endothermic, no explosions, no volcanoes. On the other hand, there must be a lot of microstates possible. Ammonium nitrate in water breaks up to ammonium and nitrate. So you can have the ammonium nitrates all around in an ordered thing. You can have ammonium, 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 nitrate, nitrate, nitrate. <laughs> you can shift them around like that. There's lots and lots of microstates for that reaction. And that's why they feel ammonium nitrate is spontaneous. It is a reaction that occurs. Enthalpy doesn't really want it to go. It's taking its energy out. But entropy says, hmm, lots of microstates, cool. It's a battle between enthalpy and entropy. Here's another example of a chemical example, not related to pieces of paper. Here we have molecule A, and A is in two possible chambers, all right? And A can really only be one or the other. Well, A can be on the left, and A can be on the right, so there's two to the first, there's two different places, two microstates. If you have two molecules in two containers, you have a lot more microstates. Three atoms in two containers, you get even more microstates. So you can see how the number of microstates is increasing. More atoms, more microstates. Six to the Avogadro's number would be the number of microstates we'd usually involved with. So the more atoms you have, the more different microstates. Entropy is going to be a player. Remember, as the W value goes up, you have more entropy, and you can totally get into tons of them. The more atoms, the more entropy. Again, I'm not going to ask you any questions on where this, what this equation is all about, but this is really where entropy falls into. The number of different individual location combinations, that means more entropy. Molecular motions are much more random in the gas state than in either the liquid or solid states. Motion in a liquid is more random than that of a solid. Gases tend to have the highest entropies, while solids have the lowest. We're going to see uh, in this section and in problem set 4, I think, and 5, there's an example of this. Um, there are actual values of entropy, all right? And these are actual values of water as ice, a solid, liquid water, and gaseous water. Um, the little zero right there means standard conditions. So if you have and these conditions and they're standard states, it's fine. And the units are usually joules per mole Kelvin. Anyway, due to microstates, solids almost always have less entropy than liquids, and liquids almost always have less entropy than gases. So if you look at these numbers, this is the lowest number. Solid has less entropy. Gas here has the biggest number that would have the highest entropy. So when we get to these values, this is a common thing we'll see. Gases have the highest entropy, solids usually have the lowest entropy, and liquids are sometimes in the middle. Now, the only time that this value will be zero is if you have a pure element in a perfectly formed crystal at zero Kelvin. How common do you think it is to have a pure element in a pure crystal at zero Kelvin? Like never, you're smiling, you should laugh. Laugh with me, please laugh, I beg of you. Yeah, it's like never, Absolutely all right? zero. Bam, right, it shouldn't even be possible. The third law of thermodynamics is what that's all about. And it's saying basically, you're never gonna have zero entropy for any substance. In theory, pure element in a pure crystal at zero Kelvin, which is a lot of ifs, that would be zero. All right, but that's almost impractical. So the third law says that almost all substances will have a positive entropy, a number larger than zero. You can see here that gaseous water is super high, solid ice water is lower, all right? So the third law is just basically saying that all substances will have a non-zero positive entropy, okay? So, 
The question here is which one of these substances will have the highest entropy? Now, Unobtainium is a bad reference to the Avatar movie, which I saw they're re-releasing. Gonna have some more Avatars. Cool! But anyway, Unobtainium is not real yet. Anyway, look at the other four here. Who cares about what's to the left? Look at the phase of matter, all right? Solids, liquids, and gases. Gases almost always will have the highest entropy, all right? Um, I haven't seen any example yet where that wasn't the case. Now, there probably is, don't get me wrong. But if you have to make a guess without a table, guess, pick the gas, all right? Because the gas will almost always be the highest entropy of all the different pieces. Would it be reasonable to guess that the second highest would be water because there's more atoms involved in a molecule? Well done, that's right. In this case, more molecules would be like more of those microstates, absolutely. So the water would probably be the next one just because it has more atoms, that's right. Liquids would be second, Gap solids would be probably the least entropy. Well done, Juliana. We'll talk about that here in just a second. All right, so here's this example. Bromine is a liquid, it's less entropy than bromine is a gas. Liquid uh, water is higher than ice, solid water, stuff like that. Heptane at 1500 Kelvin has significantly greater molecular motion than it does at 200 Kelvin. The substance has greater entropy at 1500 Kelvin than at 200 Kelvin. Entropy is definitely temperature dependent, and higher temperatures will have more entropy than lower temperatures. And you can imagine this is like if it was a warm day versus a cold day. On a cold day, I'm like covered up with my coat and stuff, and I'm like, oh, cold weather. On a nice warm day, I'm like, yeah, the sun is out, and I'm feeling optimistic about the world again. Anyway, uh, molecules are kind of the same way. Higher temperature, they have more variations, and lower temperature, they don't. So as you increase the temperature, you absolutely increase the entropy of the system too. So heptane at 1500 Kelvin, quite a bit higher than entropy at 200 Kelvin. These little dots are like the variations of the states. So up here, it was pretty crazy. In general, the more complex a molecule, the greater its entropy. We can see this trend by comparing three alkene molecules. So this is along with the amount of motion for each molecule translates into entropy. The more motion overall, the greater the entropy. This is what Juliana was basically saying earlier. Water H2O has three atoms. You've got more variations, more up and down kind of things. <clears throat> and compared to just mercury, which was just a single atom, you wouldn't have that many variations. Now these are alkanes, but same idea. One carbon, two carbon, three carbons. If they're all at the same temperature, <clears throat> excuse me, then probably propane would be higher, a lot more atoms to move around than the single atom of methane. If you have just single atoms, then you do look at molar mass. So for example, mercury, or mercury, xenon is a higher entropy than, <clears throat> than helium does, but it's not as big of a difference, in my opinion, usually as if you have more atoms. So having more atoms absolutely usually makes for higher entropy. The entropy of a solid depends on the strength of the forces holding it together. The weaker the attractive forces, the greater the motion of the ions in the crystal lattice, and the greater the entropy. Ionic compounds are also affected by entropy. Magnesium oxide is a positive two, negative two, a double handshake. Sodium fluoride, positive one, negative one, doesn't hold on as well. So there's more entropy. There's more going up and down with single handshakes than double handshakes. We've seen this before with other kind of uh, problems, how positive two, negative two is stronger than positive one, single, flat to that. Positive one, negative one is not as strong as a positive two, negative two. It doesn't vary as much with entropy. When potassium permanganate dissolves, its crystal lattice is broken apart, leading to an increase in disorder and therefore an increase in entropy. Making a solution is usually an increase in entropy, but not all the time. Sometimes the ions will coagulate. You'll have a positive ion system surrounded by negative ions. But if you have to guess, then usually entropy increases when you make a solution. We're going to talk more about this phenomena in the calcium hydroxide lab I mentioned earlier, but usually they'll go up. Um, 
increasing entropy. <clears throat> All right, well, if you boil water, you're turning a liquid into a gas. All right, and if you think about that long enough, that's definitely the biggest change in entropy. So going from a liquid to a gas, you have a big change in entropy. These other ones are mostly decreasing, stuff like that. Um, I'll start with this slide next week, Monday, but this is then the table of entropies that you can use. You don't have to memorize any of them. They're all going to be greater than zero because none of them are perfect crystals for an element at zero Kelvin, blah, blah, blah. All right, thank you. We'll do more of this next Monday. I will see you on Wednesday for class presentations. Looking forward to it. If you have any questions, let me know. Have a great day.